The whole story of what happened to him here was shocking to me. He was always a very friendly, outgoing guy when I was around. We didn't have any idea that he had this kind of background. Another thing to note is that when Schleeler went to the FBI, this then had Ohio State investigating themselves because remember, Schleetler, he was going to the horse track with Ohio State's new head coach, Earl Bruce. Gambling ruined this man's life. It made him do so many bad things, make so many irrational decisions, and I hate to sit up here and say somebody's a bad person. I just don't like doing that, but here's what I will say. He wasn't a good person. A very long time ago, there was a quarterback in college football who finished top six in Heisman voting not once, not twice, but three years in a row. To go on top of that, when his college football career was done, he was selected in the first round with the fourth overall pick in the NFL draft. So I know what you're sitting here saying. Well, Matt, this sounds great, and it was great. That was up until his one big, and I mean really big dark secret, it started to come to light. This young man was hiding something, and he was very good at hiding it for a really long time, but eventually... It just started to spiral out of control. What was this problem, you may ask? Well, he had a gambling problem, and teams were starting to find out that he was betting on games left and right. But come to find out, his gambling problem was much, and I mean much worse than people originally thought. I want to make this clear in our intro, this was much worse than a guy who was betting on a couple of games here and there. It was so bad that the FBI and doctors got involved, and one doctor said that, quote-unquote, he had an illness. That's how bad it was. Let me put this into a better perspective, though. His first year in the NFL rookie season, he gambled more money than he actually made. If that wasn't good enough for you, how about this? He started running low on money, so you know what he did? He pawned his wife's wedding ring so he could gamble more. How about this, though? The NFL, they suspended him indefinitely for gambling, and he pleaded to him. He told him, okay, I'm going to go to rehab. I'm going to fix my axe. I'll never do it again. NFL taking his word for it, they let him back in the league. You want to take a wild guess at what happens next? Only two years later, he gets caught gambling again. And I know it seems like I've already told you a lot about this guy in the intro, but this isn't even 5% of all the stuff he's done. I hope this not only gives you some context, but I hope it gets you excited for what we're about to get into. I have spent over a week doing research on this one said player and everything he's done. And I can say this confidently after looking into this as long as I have, this is the most bone-chilling downfall I've ever seen in my life. Not only is it sad, but it goes to prove something I've always believed in. People are wired differently. The thought process behind this guy's decision making, it is interesting to say the least. Normally most people in this life, after they mess up two, three, four, maybe five or six times, they eventually, somewhere down the line, they learn from their mistakes. But in this story, you'll see that number one, not only did he just not learn from his mistakes, but number two, I simply came to the conclusion that I don't think he cared about the repercussions. And I haven't even brought this up yet. He got arrested numerous times, so many times I lost count. He got arrested for gambling, drugs, committing fraud, you name it, he did it. And although most people know this guy, know his story as, oh yeah, that's the guy who had the gambling problem. Well, here's the kicker with that. He was arguably a bigger criminal than anything. He admitted to stealing over one and a half million dollars. The whole gambling argument, it's controversial, but at the end of the day, it's your money. Do whatever you want with it. Do as you please. But the whole part of this story where he's stealing money, that's for things they get a little different for me. And as bizarre as this story is, I kept asking myself this question. Why has nobody talked about it before? It's a unique situation, and there's been a lot of questions people have been asking about this guy even to this day. But however, it all circles back to the one, and I mean the one big question we're going to try to get to the bottom of in today's video. What really happened to Art Schleter? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hope all of you are having a great and fantastic day. If not, hope this video can make it a little bit better. And major shout out to this comment right here, S.M. Hollinshead. Hope I'm saying your username correctly and they stated, Matt, how about a video on Art Schleter? It's an interesting and tragic Buckeye story. I also assume you're a Buckeyes fan, so shout out to Buckeye Nation and all the Ohio State fans. Great fan base. Love interacting with you guys. You can thank this comment right here because if they wouldn't have commented this, we wouldn't be making this video. When I first saw it, I said, hmm, Art Schleter, that's the name I kind of remember but not too familiar with i put my detective hat on i was like oh yeah this is worthy of a video as always if you have any video recommendations or stories you think are worthy of a video feel free to drop a comment down below and we might make that video you never know your boy matt is a fan of the people i want to give the people what they want so you know what to do leave some recommendations down below if you enjoy football content videos like this in general sports consider subscribing to the channel it helps us out tremendously and i cannot emphasize that enough oh yeah i forgot to say this so matt when you're editing this throw this in at the beginning of the video youtube this video is for informational and educational purposes only.
that's it. I have to throw that in there. I do not condone any behavior in this video, like I said, just for educational purposes. I've jibber jabber enough though. Strap in, buckle up, get your snack, get your popcorn, get you a ferret meal. You like to even watch a video, because trust me, I do the same thing, but all right, Matt, blah, blah, shut the crap up, blah, 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 do. Let's get into it. Man, oh man, good old Art Schleetler. And yes, before we go any farther, that is how you say his name. I'm just gonna let you know right now, you're in for a treat with this video and you might as well get comfy because I got a feeling it's gonna be a long one. We got a lot to get into and you already know to get into his story, we gotta throw it all the way back to where things started. Mr. Art Schleetler was born in Blooming Bird, Ohio. This is where he attended Miami Trace High School and this is where he not only was a football star but a pretty good basketball player as well. Before I tell you how he fared out in high school, I do have to bring this up. When he was growing out, him and one of his buddies, they always used to hang around the racetracks. If you don't know what the racetracks are, basically, and I don't know how to sound sarcastic when saying this, it's where horses, they would race around the track. And when Schleetler was growing up, his family and another family that he was friends with, they owned horses there. And some people would say, well, Matt, that's insignificant to the story, but I don't think it is because I want to explain to you guys, it was natural for him to be around that environment. Fast forward in time to when he gets into high school, him and that same boy he grew up with, they were only visiting the horse track about once or twice a week. And according to his friend, they would usually bet. Now at the time, they weren't over the age of 18, and in Ohio, you had to be 18 year olds to place a bet, but his mom would do it for him. And I thought this was really interesting. I'm gonna show it to you quote unquote here. This is what his buddy said. If I had $10 to bet, it seemed like he would have 50. In other terms here, Schleetler and his family, they had more money than the average Joe. And I'm gonna give you a time frame here. When Schleetler was in high school, this was in the 1970s. So $50 back then, I'd say is the equivalent to, oh, I don't know, in 2024, probably $200. And for Schleetler, betting $50 on a horse race, that was just a normal day. At the time, though, nobody thought he had some major and big deal problem because that was normal. And remember, he grew up in that environment. But I think it's extremely vital to our story because growing up, that was normal to him. Little did his peers and everybody else know this would turn into a huge problem down the road that we're about to get into. Back to the football field though we go, in high school, he was a star and he never lost a single game in 30 starts. He was a highly touted prospect and we don't have a ranking for him because like I told you guys, this is back in the 1970s. We didn't have 24 seven sports and rivals.com quite just yet. He decided to commit and sign with Ohio State and this is where he started four years in a row. And this is where he played for, and I'm sure this name is going to ring a bell for a lot of you, Coach Woody Hayes. And I hope this goes to prove how touted and highly regarded that Art Schleter was coming out of high school. Woody Hayes wanted him so bad that he told Schleter if he comes to Ohio State, he'll let him pass the ball 25 times a game. Which in the 1970s, especially for Woody Hayes, that was out of the ordinary. But like I said, that goes to prove just how bad Woody Hayes wanted him because he was willing to change his entire offensive scheme. And although Woody Hayes wanted him really bad, his first year as a starting quarterback, it didn't go so well. In the year of 1978, he had an abysmal completion percentage of only 46%, and that's rounding it up. Had 1,045 passing yards, and check this out. <laughs> Four touchdowns to 20 interceptions. Oh my goodness, guys. That might be the worst stat line I've ever seen in one of these videos. No, 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 no. What am I talking about? Not one of It is the worst stat line I've ever seen. Four touchdowns to 20 INTs. Buddy, what was you doing back there? I could somewhat overlook the 46 completion percentage and the 1,000 passing yards because you got to remember the time of football back then. You weren't passing for 4,000 yards a season. 20 interceptions, that's ridiculous. He only had 71 completions that year. And you know what, now that I think about it, that's what makes the interceptions worse. He wasn't even passing the ball a lot and still had 20 INTs. He had 155 pass attempts, assuming he played 11, 12 games that year. He only passed the ball about, what, 12 times a game and still had 20 INTs. I can't get over that. Thankfully, the next three years after that, they were much better. And it's crazy I say much better, because when you look at these stats and numbers, you're going to be like, Matt, these suck. But in all three of these years, he finished in the top six in the Heisman voting. In 1979, he increased nearly all of his numbers. He jumped up his completion percentage to, we'll round it up to 53%, and had 1,500 passing yards. That's nice. And his touchdown to interception ratio, he cleaned it up, thankfully. He had 13 touchdowns and only five INTs. On the ground that season, he also added 400 yards and nine touchdowns. And I forgot to throw this in there, but in 1978, he did have 500 rushing yards and 11 touchdowns. Touchdowns. But that still doesn't really change anything because those passing numbers are atrocious. And in 1979, this is the year where he finished fourth in the Heisman race. It's hard to believe these numbers were worthy of fourth in the Heisman race even back then. 
I think it's more than fair to say that times they have definitely changed. Although things drastically improved for him his sophomore season at Ohio State, off the field, this is where the problems they started to arise. There was multiple different reports of people spotting Schlittler at the horse track, remember, that he was going to when he was growing up. There was not one, not two, but three different agencies that was tracking him while he's at Ohio State. And it was stated by a former Ohio State police officer that Schlittler's fondness of the track was quote-unquote a common knowledge around the campus. So by his junior year at Ohio State, people are starting to pay attention to him a little bit closer. And you understand why. This is the starting quarterback for Ohio State back then. And at a racing track that's near the university, people are seeing him there, not just once a month, but they're seeing him a couple times a week and everybody's like, well, wait a minute. What is old Schlittler doing here? Isn't that the quarterback? It definitely raised some questions and rightfully so. That'd be the equivalent to the starting quarterback of Alabama or Georgia at your local casino two or three times a week. Wouldn't you question that? But although it raised some questions and red flags and gossip in general, nothing was done at the time. Although now it's been proven his freshman and sophomore year at Ohio State, he was betting on horse races. But check this out. His junior year, when they started really investigating him, this is when he started betting on games. So now we're taking it to a different level. We're not talking about horses. We're talking about professional games, college basketball games, and college football games. And when his junior season came to an end, it was said that he lost thousands of dollars. But one thing that was sort of brushed aside that I thought was really interesting, when he was going to the track, he was going there with Earl Bruce. You were sitting here going, well, Matt, who is Earl Bruce? Why does that name matter? That's because that was the successor, the head coach after Woody Hayes, who took over Ohio State. So there was this whole conspiracy theory going around that since he was hanging out with Earl Bruce, the people that was investigating him, they just brushed it aside and gave him a pass. You can do what you want with the information, but I definitely agree because if you're hanging out with the future head coach of Ohio State, yeah, people are going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Let me show you stats, though, for his junior season in 1980. He completed roughly 53% of his passes, had 1,600 passing yards with 12 touchdowns to only 8 INTs. On the ground rushing, didn't do nothing too crazy, 340 yards with 7 touchdowns as well. And I know it's hard to fathom with these numbers, but in 1980, he finished 6th in the Heisman voting. Take a look at this, though. His senior year, they start to crack down on him. I'm going to show this to you word for word because I don't want you to be confused and you can follow along. Dave Daly, who's head of the Columbus Organized Crime Bureau, said recently that officers in his department had spotted Schlittler at the racetrack. I don't even know how to say that S word, but the, what to say, Skieto Downs, that's the racetrack. Continuing along after Downs, a harness track in the Columbus suburb of Lockburn, quote unquote, on more than one occasion with Frank Hook. Whom Daly described as quote unquote one of the biggest bookmakers in Central Ohio. Daly also said that through informants, quote unquote, we verify that Schleitler and Hook had participated in the same quote unquote after hours high stakes poker game. Daly said his department had been told there were quote unquote thousands of dollars on the table. Yet again, thousands of dollars back in 1970, that's probably the equivalent to tens of thousands nowadays. Schleitler was confronted about this and he wound up denying everything. Quote unquote, I know him by name, but honestly, I never met the man referring to Hook. I have never seen him. I have never talked to him. And I don't think he has seen me unless he ever saw me play football. After a pause, he added, since this happened, I guess I've been hooked up with everybody. Anybody you can imagine. Hmm, interesting, interesting. What do y'all think about that? So on one hand here, we got the Columbus Crime Bureau basically spotting him at the horse track, and then they confront him about it, and Schluter saying, oh, no, no, that wasn't me. I wasn't playing with that guy. And when I say that guy, I'm referring to the hook guy who the Crime Bureau is stating is the biggest bookmaker in Central Ohio. Now, what was really interesting about this is the bookmaker, Hook, he wound up getting convicted on two felony counts of gambling. And take a listen to this. The police actually wound up finding his book where he was placing all these bets with his clients. And when they found this book, they said, bingo, jackpot, because they thought they were going to find Art Schleter's name in the book, his initials, or something along those lines. But guess what? This bookie that Schleter was working with, he was one step ahead of everybody else because he had a code in his book, and they couldn't decipher what the code was. So in other terms here, they couldn't prove Schleter was involved with this bookie whatsoever, and... He got off the hook. And here's what the guy who was leading the investigation had to say. Quote, unquote, there's a lot of smoke, but we never found the fire. And that's got to be frustrating. You find the bookie that Art Schleitler is working with. You convict him. You then find his book. And you still can't prove that the quarterback for Ohio State, Schleitler, was gambling. And since they couldn't prove it, 
Oh, Schleitler here, he just kept playing ball. And in his senior season in 1981, I'd say for back then, it was a solid season. Completed 53% of his passes, had a huge increase on his passing yards, nearly 2,400, 15 touchdowns to 9 INTs. His rushing yards are interesting, though. I don't really know what happened because there's not too much film from the 1980s. But he had negative 20 rushing yards back then. I guess this is when Ohio State started to transition over to passing more because you see the huge spike in his passing yards and his rushing yards, negative 20. Not too sure what went down there, but it's not that big of a deal. And in that 1981 season, he finished fifth in the Heisman voting. And at this point in time in his life, he's got to be feeling like the man. He's gambling all throughout college. They catch him gambling, but they can't prove it. And he's still getting to go out there and ball out, finish top six in the Heisman three years in a row. Essentially speaking here, he played with fire at Ohio State all four years and didn't get burnt. And I'm trying to compare this situation to the modern times in 2024. If there was a top quarterback prospect heading into the NFL draft, which is coming up relatively soon, coincidentally enough, and there was gambling allegations and suspicion around him heading into the draft, don't you think that would affect his draft stock even a little bit? You have to assume he'd fall in the draft just due to all the red flags and suspicion going on. Because nowadays, if you've got a wide receiver who's projected to go in the first round and he fails a drug test, he's falling to the second or third round. Well, back then, my only assumption is they didn't care about the red flags whatsoever because he got selected in the first round with the fourth overall pick by what we now know him as the Indianapolis Colts, but back then, they were the Baltimore Colts. And you want to know what's even crazier about this story if it wasn't crazy enough? He got beat out for the starting job by another quarterback the Colts took in the same draft but that quarterback was selected in the fourth round. Art Schleter lost the starting job to Mike Pagel, and that whole quarterback system for the Colts back then, it just wasn't working out. They was bringing in new quarterbacks left and right, trying to find somebody that was good enough to retain the starting job. And you would think since Art Schleter got drafted number four overall, and he's getting beat out by the fourth round selection, that that would light a fire inside of him, and he would work extremely hard so he could win over the starting quarterback job. But that didn't happen. You know what happened instead? Schleter's gambling problem, it got worse, and I mean much worse. When he signed with the Colts back in the 1980s, he had a $350,000 signing bonus. Not too shabby, especially by then. Well, by the halfway point in his rookie season, he spent every single penny of that 350 k And by the end of his rookie season, he was in the negatives. He lost more money than he officially made. We're talking about an NFL player, guys. And it was also stated that before the Colts even selected him, he was getting loans from bookies because he knew he was going to be a top pick in the NFL draft. In other terms, he was calling these bookies and saying, hey man, I'm about to be a top pick. I'm going to get $200,000, $300,000, so can you upfront me $40,000? And the bookies, they would do it because either one of two things. They either A, knew he was good for it, or B, they knew they could blackmail him. This isn't even an assumption for me. This is a cold hard fact. He was more infatuated with gambling than playing football. His rookie season, he only appeared in three games, didn't start a single one, and he only threw 37 passes in which he completed 17 of those. That's only completing about 46%. Didn't have a single touchdown pass, remember, fourth overall pick in the NFL draft and had two INTs. This guy sucked, and I don't have a problem if you suck at anything in this life and you're trying to get better, you're working harder, you're trying to progress. But with him, he wasn't trying. That's what gets to me. It's what pisses me off. He worked harder at finding loopholes as to how he could gamble and get around all of it and get these loans from bookies than playing football. I guarantee you he spent more time researching how he could bet than actually watching film. Was watching film even a thing back in the 1980s? I don't know, but I assume they did it to a certain degree. Here's where things started to get crazy, though. In 1982, this is when the NFL had a 57-day strike. 57 days. Why is that number important? Because within that span of 57 days, Art Schleter lost $700,000. Out of that $700,000, one of those was a $20,000 bet on a college football game in which, take a wild guess here, he lost. And this all has me thinking, if he lost $700,000 in 57 days, I wonder how much money he actually placed on bets. Because the $700,000 number, that's just what he lost. That's not the total amount of money he bet. And if you're sitting there wondering, well, Matt, if he signed to the Colts and they gave him a signing bonus of $350,000, how did he afford to pay off this $700,000? And that's the problem with all this. He couldn't. He couldn't pay the $700,000, so 
he was in debt to all these bookies. And Art Schleter wound up stating that the reason he lost so much money in a short amount of time is because he tried to make it up after big losses. For example, he said one week he'd bet 20k and if he lost all that money he'd double it the next week and then double it and double it and so on so on you know how it goes. If he lost 20 he'd say alright let's do 40. If he lost 40, 80 and then 160 and then you're just spiraling out of control. And in the winter of 1982 heading into the spring of 1983 he lost Schleter $489,000 just on basketball games. And one thing that was always brought up when I was looking at different articles and stuff is he mostly did bet on basketball games. I'm not too sure what his whole infatuation was with basketball, but thought it was an interesting point. And all of this wound up getting so bad that in 1983, Schuettler, he put his pride aside and he went to the FBI. And although I do applaud him for going to the FBI and saying, hey, I messed up and admitting to his crimes, Another main reason he went there is because he was fearing for his life because of the bookies and how much money he owed them. And they wound up reaching an agreement. The FBI said, pretty much, hey, if you wound up snitching on these guys and give us some good leads, we won't punish you as hard. And that's what happened. And Art Schleetler, he wound up snitching on every single bookie and they got arrested on federal charges. And Schleetler wound up stating himself another reason he went to the FBI is because he feared the bookies were going to make him throw NFL games and he wasn't about that. And while the NFL and the FBI, they're doing their investigation, it was stated that Schleetler would bet on craps, poker, backgammon, anything. So we're not just talking about football, basketball, anything like that. He was also just a gambler in general. And according to an NFL official who was working with the investigation, here's what he stated, quote unquote. I don't think there were too many days of the week that Art didn't bet on something. However, the league was satisfied that Schleetler did not bet on games involving the Colts. Another thing to note is that when Schleetler went to the FBI, this then had Ohio State investigating themselves because remember, Schleetler... He was going to the horse track with Ohio State's new head coach, Earl Bruce. So Ohio State winds up launching their whole separate investigation talking about, well, we want to see if Earl Bruce and other players and other coaches, they were involved with Schleetler. To make an extremely long story short, though, nothing came out of it, and Schleetler said that he did all this on his own. And the head coach, Earl Bruce, he wound up stating that him and Art Schleetler, they were never together. They never rode to the horse track together. None of that. Denied everything. Going back to this, though, according to Schleetler in an interview he did, he mostly bet on college basketball games and in total 12 NFL games, including mostly Monday night games and playoff games. And here's what a league official for the NFL stated, quote unquote, when they was doing their investigation. What bothered us the most is that if he won, he collected his money. But if he lost, the bookies would carry him. If they were carrying him, they were carrying him for a reason. At some point, they were going to want the money or a favor. And remember, we talked about that. I said there's two reasons they were carrying him in other terms, loaning him out the money. And they stated, continuing long here after favor and what was the favor or what's the favor you get what i'm trying to say so that right there is why the nfl they were pretty concerned about all this because they're thinking hey if this guy owes them money and he can't pay it he might throw a game or two which in reality it probably wouldn't have ever happen because schleetler it wasn't even good enough to be out there on the field in the first place so that's number one and number two schleetler say what you want about him but he did have some pride about himself and some integrity because he wasn't about throwing games for his team or even betting on his team. That's one thing to note. Schleler never bet on the Colts. Can't emphasize that enough. And just the thought of the bookies wanting him to throw a game made him go to the FBI. Here's what the Baltimore Colts general manager, Ernie Accorsi, at the time had to say about all this. The whole story of what happened to him here was shocking to me. He was always a very friendly, outgoing guy when I was around. We didn't have any idea that he had this kind of background. Here's what Doug Donnelly, a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys and former teammate of Schleetler's at Ohio State had to say about all of this. I knew Art when we went to the racetrack. I even went with him a couple of times and we would play a little poker here and there, but his gambling then was never to the extent it was in Baltimore. Just remember that quote because we may come back to that a little later in this video. Just remember that. Stay tuned. Continuing along here, here's what Schleetler had to say about everything growing up and maybe his tendencies of gambling dating back to his childhood. Quote unquote, my parents weren't poor. I had always worked summers for my dad and I had saved some money, so I always had money to buy things that I wanted. I did not have a lot, not in college, but I always had spending money. So by this point in time in our story, let's do a brief recap because I know it's been a lot. Drafted by the Colts, he winds up blowing all of his money, he gets in the debt, gets so far into debt that 
he feels like he has no other choice but to go to the FBI. Goes to the FBI, rats out all the bookies that loaned him money, and here we are. Moving along here though, the NFL felt like they had no other choice but to suspend him indefinitely. It was for obvious reasons, they felt like he was a detriment to the league, and I shouldn't have to explain why. Well, Schlittler wasn't too big of a fan of that, and he pleaded to the commissioner at the time, Pete Rozelle, that I'm gonna go to rehab, I'm gonna seek treatment, can we somehow find a middle ground here because I want to get back to playing football. I love football. And the commissioner having some grace told him, all right, look, I'll reduce your suspension to 13 months, but you got to go seek treatment. So all throughout his suspension, he winds up going to treatment and he gets reinstated for the 1984 season. That's great. He didn't just make a mistake. He made a huge mistake, but he learned from it. At least that's what they thought. Although they didn't know this at the time, we know this now, during that suspension, he was still gambling on games. Although it wasn't football, he was still gambling on basketball, which was obviously a big no-no because that's the whole reason you're suspended in the first place. You're not supposed to gamble. You're supposed to be at rehab. Fast forward time though into the 1985 season, after five games, the Colts, they wind up releasing him. You wanna know why the Colts wind up releasing him after five games? Take a wild guess, you know what I'm about to say, because of his gambling. There was a ton of rumors and speculations about Art Schleitler gambling even before that. They just couldn't prove anything. And the Colts made it extremely clear when they brought him back. Hey, if we find out you're gambling, you're done. And I gotta give some props to them because they stuck to their word. And this is where things get funny in our story. The Colts caught him in one of the wildest ways ever. You see, during his brief stint where he was suspended from the NFL, he couldn't play, he got into golfing. So now you know we're about to go with this. Art Schlittler, he started gambling on golf. Well, come to find out, Schlittler, he wound up losing what is stated as a significant amount of money over the spring and summer when he was playing golf. And at one point in time, he lost $2,000 during a match and he didn't have it on cash on him at the time, so he wound up writing a check for it. But it still shouldn't have seemed like too big of a deal. You're just writing one of your friends a check. Maybe he did a favor for you, so he wouldn't have got caught there. But the problem with that was he told his said friend, hey, don't cash this check until after the season because I don't have the money right now. And I didn't get an exact time frame of when his buddy did this, but the guy he wrote the check to, at some point in time, he called the Colts organization to ask him if the check was good to be cashed. So you know where this is going when that random dude calls up the Colts and says, hey, is this check from Art Schleet or good to cash? Or like, what are you talking about, dude? What, what check? And then the guy goes, oh yeah, we're playing golf, we was gambling, and he bet me $2,000 and lost, and yeah, he got busted. It was downhill from there on out. The things I would do to hear that phone call, I would pay money, I'm talking about good money, not a lot, probably like 50 bucks, to hear that exchange on the phone. And number one, here's what I'm thinking too, how did this buddy he wrote the check to have the number to the Colts? Like, did he call the owner? Did he call the front office? Who did he talk to? And the reason I'd say I love to hear the phone call is because I just imagine this is how the call went. Guy calls the number, it's ringing, he picks up, hey, this is the Colts front office, how can you help you? He proceeds to say, oh yeah, uh, did y'all pay Art Schleetler his monthly salary? Because uh, I got this check from him I need to cash. And I just know Schleetler was pissed off when he found out that dude called the front office. Let me put this into a better perspective so we can relate a little bit more. This would be the equivalent to you owing your buddy money and you're like, hey, don't cast the check until I get paid from work. I get paid in a couple of weeks. And then your buddy shows up to the job at Pizza Hut talking to the manager, hey, when does Matt B. Gray get paid? Cause that dude owes me 200 bucks. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And I can laugh at that all day, but we gotta get a move on cause we still got a lot and I mean a lot to go over. And I should have showed you this before I talked about 1985, but in the 1984 season, the first year back, when he got reinstated, he did start five games. And in those five games, you know what his record was? 0-5. Completed an abysmal 44% of his passes, had 700 passing yards with three touchdowns, two seven interceptions. Art Schleter pretty much sucked. We'll leave it at that. And in 1985, the season where he got caught yet again for gambling due to the golfing incident, he only started one game in which he went 0-1. He had zero touchdowns to, as you can see right here, two interceptions. And that 1985 season for the Colts would be his last season of playing meaningful football in the NFL. This man truly went out sad. Wasn't good at football, wasn't good at gambling, wasn't good at anything. And it has me thinking, even if he wouldn't get caught for this gambling stuff, how much longer would he even have been on an NFL roster? The dude had a record of 0-6. A year after he got released by the Colts in 1996, he did wind up signing as a free agent with the Buffalo Bills, but the Bills quickly released him because they had Jim Kelly. And after Schleitler was released by the Bills, he sat out the entire 1986 season due to no other teams wanting him. And since he didn't play in 1986 and no other teams wanted him, 
he had a lot of time to think, and that's not good for O.R. Schlitler here. Because in 1986 and 1987, he was scheming up some, let's just say, not so good things. And this is where early in 1987 in January, he got in trouble with the law for running a multi-million dollar sports betting operation. To make a long story short here, he pleaded guilty and they decided just to put him on probation. And in that same summer, he wound up trying out for the Cincinnati Bengals. And although he wasn't good enough to be a starter, the Bengals told him they'd bring him in as the backup quarterback and he'd be back in the league. And the Bengals wanted to, for some odd reason, to bring him on, but the NFL commissioner at the time, Roselle, he vetoed the deal. He wouldn't allow it. And the reason he wouldn't allow it is because he just got arrested for the multi-million dollar sports betting operation he was doing. And here's my question to you guys. Do you blame the commissioner? You already gave this guy one chance and he screwed it up. Why would you give him another? I try to have some sympathy and empathy, but I really don't have any form in this situation to the slice of bits. Fast forward time into 1988, Schlietler, he tried to get reinstated to the NFL, but they turned him down again, and this is when he filed for bankruptcy. So with his NFL career coming to an end, remember in his rookie season where he spent all of that 350k signing bonus? He wound up stating he did all that due to he was battling a messy breakup with his girlfriend and it made him depressed and it led to him gambling more. And then he also stated that due to all of his early success at Ohio State, it lessened his drive, or not lessen, that's not a good word to use, but we'll say, oh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Diminish his drive. And I can understand that because that's human nature to see a lot of success and you're like, hey, I'm the top G, I'm the top dog, I don't need to work as hard. I get that. But he also added to it since he had all that success, it put a lot of pressure on him and since he had a lot of pressure that led him to gamble more. And that right there is where I'm having a hard time trying to even rationalize that because that doesn't make sense to me since you had pressure on you to succeed and i get that you did have pressure it made you gamble more i guess he's trying to claim it was a detox to him if that makes sense like it made him not think about stuff as much i don't know what he's trying to say but i really don't care what alibi he wants to use here there's no excuse for gambling all your nfl money away none i don't feel sorry for people in general you know how your boy matt is i'm harsh because i'm harsh on myself this life is hard especially for a man with that being said though i especially don't feel sorry and feel bad for people that are millionaires i don't want to go on a rant here we may say that for the end let's continue along so schleitler since he couldn't get into the nfl he said whatever f it we ball anyways i'm going to the canadian football league and at the time, it didn't seem like a bad idea. Get you a fresh start, get away from the environment you grew up in, and, you know, maybe things could turn around. And somehow, some way, he won the starting job, but unfortunately, halfway through the season, he suffered some broken ribs, and he had to be placed on the injury reserve list, and after 30 days, they released him. At this point in time in our story, he is banned from the NFL. He can't even play in the CFL, the Canadian League. They don't want him. So it then resulted to what I'm going to label as last chance you in all these stories, the Arena Football League. I think we can all agree here, that is what I'll do respect, the bottom of the barrel. If you can't make the NFL, you go to the CFL. You can't make the CFL, you then go to Arena Football. And in the Arena Football League, it was actually a turn of events for him. He was really successful, and he was named the MVP. And let me also give you some more context here. He played for the Detroit Drive in 1990 and 1991. And heading into the 1992 season, he wound up being traded to the Cincinnati Rockers. And this was a very strategical move by the league because they believed since he was very popular in the state of Ohio, this would generate more buzz for the franchise. And it wound up turning out pretty good because he helped lead the Rockers to the playoffs. But not too long after that, he announced that he's done. He's retiring from the game of football. He's going to focus on other things. And one of those things he wanted to focus on is no other than his radio career. He wanted to broadcast some games and talk about sports. And at first glance, people somewhat admired him for it. He went out on top, won MVP, was making the playoffs in the Arena Football League, and he wants to pursue other avenues in his career, be a radio announcer. This is great. But come to find out, that was a lie. He didn't retire from the AFL. They banned him because they caught him gambling. And guess what he was gambling on? Not college basketball and NFL games. No, no, no. He was gambling on the AFL games, the one he was playing in. And they told him to make it look better for himself. He can tell the public he's retiring. But no, it was one of those situations where they banned him. And they said, yeah, well, you can just say you retire. What an idiot, man. That's all I got to say about this. It's one thing to make a mistake in this life or even a couple as long as you learn from them. Because contrary to your belief, I'm talking to every single one of you watching this video, you're going to make mistakes in this life. Even me making this video, I tell you up front, I've made 
countless of mistakes in my life and I'm gonna make many more, I can promise you that. But as I get older and I start to mature, I try to limit those mistakes. And more importantly, I try to learn from other people's mistakes. Cause in this life, it's good to learn from yours, but it's even better to learn from others. That way you ain't gotta go through that whole process. Well, in this case and scenario, Art Schleter didn't learn from his mistakes. And I honestly just think it got to the point where he didn't care. He was gonna gamble regardless. He didn't care about repercussions. I assume this is how a conversation with him and one of the bookies went when he was playing for their arena football league. Art Schleter called him, hey, I wanna put $5,000 on this team we're playing against. And they'd say, oh, well, oh, Art, that's probably not a good idea, buddy, because you've been caught gambling like three or four times and it's pretty much ruined your life. And Art Schleter would probably say, so are you gonna put that 5,000 on the game or do I need to call somebody else? That's how the conversation went. I know that's how it went. He didn't care about what would happen to him if he got caught. Put my 5K on my arena football team because we're gonna win the championship. We'll talk more about that later in the video. Let's talk about his radio career that happened after he retired or my bad, he didn't retire, they forced him out. We wind up somehow landing a job. I don't know why anyone would wanna work with him, but he got a job and things were going great for him. Well, fast forward in time into 1994, he got caught stealing checks from a station owner that goes by the name of Jerry Kuttner in order to, guess what, get money to gamble. So in our terms here, Jerry Kuttner, the owner of the radio show, gave Art Schleter a job and Schleter tried taking advantage of him. And I'm just not thinking about this as when I'm speaking and making this video. I have a feeling that Art Schleter was a really good talker. I guarantee you he was a people pleaser. Cause think about all the opportunities he got. He shouldn't have got those in the first place. He had to just be a smooth talker. And I don't want to diagnose people cause I'm in no position to do that whatsoever, but I'm pretty sure he had to be some type of narcissist. But not only a narcissist, a certified menace to society. And you'll see why in just a second. It has been stated that Schleitler stole money from friends, family, and even strangers when he needed the money to gamble. And let me put this into a better perspective and I should have said this earlier. Schleter gambled every single day. So if he had the funds for it, great, he's gonna gamble. But if he didn't have the funds for it, he's like, all right, how am I gonna find the money to gamble? And that's when he would steal stuff. But it also got to the point when he wouldn't steal from people, he would go to the casinos and he would write bad checks. Cause back in the day, you could write personal checks to some casinos and they would take that money. So he would go to the casino, write a thousand dollar check, they'd give him a thousand dollars. And if he won the money back, great, he could pay the casino for it. But if he didn't win the money, it didn't matter because he was writing bad checks in the first place. And as to how he kept going to these casinos and writing these bad checks, I have no idea. I guess it's just back then they didn't have all the technology to keep up with it. But when it was all said and done, according to Schleter in an interview he did with ESPN in 2007, he estimated that he stole over $1.5 million. Most of the $1.5 million though, it came from the bad checks. Because in a five year span from 1987 to 1992, Schleter was arrested three times in Ohio for passing bad checks. Take a listen to this though. In 1989, he moved to Las Vegas with his new girlfriend, Mitzi Shinovar, because he claimed this was in hopes of getting treatment for his addiction. You know why that's a little ironic, right? You moved to Las Vegas to cure your gambling addiction? What? You probably know what I'm about to say next. Instead of curing, quote unquote, his gambling addiction, it got worse. It wound up getting so bad in Vegas that Schleitler pawned his wife, his new wife's wedding ring to get money to gamble. And his wife also stated there was numerous times where he was vomiting in the floor due to how nervous he was watching sports games. While he's in Vegas as well, he somehow got access to his old checkbook from his sister and he would use those checks to write money to the casinos to gamble. And eventually he got caught and this is where the FBI, they got involved again. And finally, he was charged with fraud for passing $175,000 in bad checks to a Las Vegas casino. And here's the thing about Schleitler, he never hid away from it. He pleaded guilty every single time. But the prosecutors, they were having some sympathy for him, I guess, and they were gonna reduce his sentence to only 15 months. However, while this prosecution was going on, come to find out, Schleitler was caught for passing bad checks in Indiana as well. And take a listen to this. So he got caught for passing $175,000 in bad checks in Las Vegas. In Indiana, he passed over $500,000 in bad checks. He got canned for that and he had to serve in total 16 months in jail, but when he got out, he got caught stealing more checks. This time they were harsher on him and he was sentenced to eight years in federal prison. By this point in time, his wife, Mitzi, she had enough and she divorced him. Somehow, someway though, he got released early on probation in 1999. Remember, he was sentenced to eight years in prison. He only served 13 months. 
That's ridiculous. And when he got out, he returned to his hometown, which is, remember, in Bloomingburg, Ohio. And while he's in jail, he came up with another brilliant scheme to run up that money. He decided that he was going to tell everybody in the state of Ohio, friends, family, etc., that he found a way to get great Ohio State tickets to all the games. We're talking first row, 50-yard line, and he was going to get them for the cheap ski deeski the low ski doski whatever you want to call it. And he told all the people, hey, if you want these tickets, give me the money now, and when I get the money to buy the tickets, we'll share all the profits. But instead, you know what he did? When all the people gave him the money to buy the tickets, he didn't buy the tickets because he had no way of accessing them. He lied. He used the money to gamble. And we're not talking about couple thousand dollars in total he made over five hundred thousand dollars from that scheme alone and you want to know who's included in that scheme his father he scammed his own dad good gosh almighty man you want to talk about the lowest of lows that's just oh man that's just awful he got caught for that go figure this guy knows by this point in time he's not gonna get away with stuff and he pled guilty and he was sentenced to five years in prison here's my biggest question how does a guy who's now been caught for this four to five, six, seven plus times, only get five years in prison. What are we doing? And take a listen to this. From 1995 to 2006, Schleitler served the equivalent of 10 years in 44 different county jails and federal prisons. <laughs> and take a listen to this. While he's in jail, he had a person sneaking a phone to the jail so he could place bets. You can't make this up. The said person who was sneaking in the phone to him in the jail was his public defender at the time. And she got caught for it, of course. She got two years of probation and her law license suspended. But here's my question. Why is a public defender even doing that in the first place? What do you gain from sneaking in a cell phone for somebody you're defending? I have no idea. Fast forward time here to finally the 2000s in 2004, Schleitler, he got caught gambling in prison and he was placed in solitary confinement. And he was supposed to spend four months in solitary confinement, but due to quote unquote good behavior, got released after 100 days. So you've noticed a pattern here. Schleitler, every time he gets caught, he pleads guilty and whenever he goes to jail, he gets out early on good probation behavior. He officially got released from prison in June of 2006, and from 2006 all the way up into 2011, there's not too much to say. He was just a normal Joe, normal person. Well, in 2011, this is where things get rather intriguing, to say the least. He starts talking to a girl that goes by the name of Anita Vatko Barney, who is a widow to the former CEO of Wendy's. So yeah, you can immediately assume here... She made off with some serious guap here. She's got a ton of money now. And randomly, Arch Leader just starts talking to her out of nowhere. I mean, come on now. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what Arch Leader wants. He wants some money. Sure, maybe he found her attractive, but you know what he wanted. He was after the money. And this lady, I feel bad for her. She couldn't see past it, and she had a relationship with him. And their relationship lasted roughly two years. And over that two-year span, Schleter got over $1 million from her to... Take a guess, gamble. And in February of 2011, reports came out that Schleter, he was under investigation for fraud, and yeah, he did it, to make a long story short. He tried to pull off a scheme where he was going to buy all these seats for Ohio State basketball and football games, and he, he got caught. It didn't work out. And on September 15th of 2011, Schleter pleaded guilty to state charges of theft and engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity. And this is where he was sentenced his longest sentence yet of 10 years in state prison. While he was awaiting to be assigned to go to a state prison because they didn't do all that quite just yet, he was on house arrest. He failed a drug test. And since he failed a drug test, he was sentenced to 10 years and 7 months in federal prison prison. While Schleitler was incarcerated, he somehow someway found a way to gamble in prison yet again. This is where he had a woman place bets for him and was running a Super Bowl ticket scheme from inside the prison. The prison officials, they found out about it and you know what they did? They said, all right, we're going to punish him hard. So they cut off his email access for 90 days. No emails for Art Schleitler. I don't know, maybe it's just me. That seems like a very minuscule punishment to catch somebody doing something that's pretty bad. Eventually, though, in August of 2020, he got released from federal prison to get transferred over to state prison. And when he was getting transferred over, his lawyers tried to get the rest of the sentence waived off due to health reasons. But the judge that was covering the case didn't have too much sympathy for him because he stated, quote-unquote, that Schuettler was past the point of rehabilitation. He did get released in 2021, which was great, but unfortunately, not too long after, in June of 2022, Schleitler was found unresponsive by police in Hilliard, Ohio in a Hampton Inn hotel room. 
Schlegler wound up pleading guilty, and this is where he got sentenced to one year probation in September of 2023. He wound up to turn out to be okay, but real recently, in February of 2024, so exactly only a month ago, he got arrested again. A state trooper wound up seeing Streetler just standing by a car in the middle of the road and it wasn't moving, so he figured, hey, why not? He'd figure out what was going on. We'll come to find out the officer looks into the floorboard of the car and he sees crack. Obviously, he gets arrested immediately and it was said that he's gonna face up to 11 months in prison. If you wanna look at this story from a positive outlook, I guess we could say this, at least that final arrest that happened only a month ago, he didn't get arrested for gambling. And that is where our story ends, and at least we got a pretty good up-to-date on that because, like I said, he just got arrested a month ago because officer found crack in his car, and he'll probably serve that, get out, and make another disastrous decision just based off of his history. What a story, though, man. What a story. And let me give you my final thoughts and conclusion on all of this. I have two questions myself, and if you made it all the way to this point of the video, let me know your thoughts down below. Question number one is, I wonder how much him being around gambling at a young age and him doing it at a young age, it affected him in the long run. Because remember, at a young age, he was always at the horse track, and I assume everybody else there, they were also gambling, and it was a normal, everyday occurrence for him. And I would like to assume it started off with betting $1, then $2, then $4, 5 6 7 8 and so on, so on. And he liked the adrenaline rush of it, and when you bet $5 for... A year straight, you kind of get numb to it. So you're like, all right, I need to bet $10. Yeah, there we go. That'll get my adrenaline back up. And then by the time he got into the NFL, we saw just how much of adrenaline rush he needed. He was betting $20,000, $30,000 every week. So that is one of my questions. I wonder if he was never around that horse track environment growing up, if he would have turned out the same way. Maybe he would have. We never know. Question number two is, and this is going to be a little different one here, I wonder if he just got bored in life. And I know what you're sitting there saying, Matt, bored? What are you talking about? What does that have to do with gambling and losing all this money and everything he did? For myself, and I'll share this with you guys, I'm an extremely competitive person. I love to compete, and I don't want to say my sole purpose and reasoning for being on Earth right now is just to be a competitor, but I love to do it. And I've noticed one thing about myself is I really have a hard time getting engaged in any activity in this life if I'm not competing. I have a hard time enjoying things if there's nothing on the line, if that makes sense. There's certain things in life where people, they may get excited about them. I think your normal person would, but to me, it's mundane. If I'm not pushing myself to the limits every single day, I get bored. And as I've gotten older, I've started to realize why people climb Mount Everest. Growing up, I was always like, why is somebody risking their life to climb Mount Everest? What's the point of that? You don't get a trophy for it. You don't get money for it. Why are they doing that? But now, I get it. People climb Mount Everest and do all these crazy things in life for excitement and to just not be bored. And when I tell you I love to compete, I mean, a lot of times I just like competing with myself, especially when I go work out in the gym. It doesn't have to be I'm competing against you in ping pong or playing pool, golf, or anything sports-wise. No, it can be something as simple as I'm competing with myself. If I bench press 225 for eight reps last week, well, this week I wanna do 225 for 10 reps. I have to compete in anything and everything. If I don't, I get perpetually bored. I say I like to say this. I wonder if Arch Leader here, the reason for his gambling is because if he didn't gamble, he'd be bored. I don't know, but here's what I do know. Gambling ruined this man's life. And it's not gambling that did it really, but you get what I'm trying to say. He ruined his own life. It made him do so many bad things, make so many irrational decisions. And I hate to sit up here and say somebody's a bad person. I just don't like doing that. But here's what I will say. He wasn't a good person. You guys want to call him a bad person in the comment section? You got every right to do so because I've presented you all the information and you can form your own opinion. I've been up here long enough though. This might arguably be one of the longest videos I've ever done on the channel. A lot of work went into it. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you do like content like this, consider subscribing. But I'm curious. Let me know your thoughts and everything down below. But that woman is.